Um, Sarah, you started out uh, after college, if you're getting your uh, undergraduate degree, uh, as a government economist. Um, it's an odd transition from that to be a journalist. What prompted the, what prompted that move? Well, let me first say, like, at the time, this is a long time ago, uh, economics was not as quantitative as it is now. My first job as an economist was literally calling people up and asking them how much they charged for different items. Uh, I worked for something called the Producer Price Index, something very similar to what you guys might know of as the Consumer Price Index, where it measures inflation. And my entire job was to figure out who was lying to me. So uh, I spent my first five years on the job calling people up and trying to figure out who was lying to me. And then it got more quantitative, and I moved into management, and um, I got married, and my poor husband thought that he had married a nice government worker who was going to stay there for the rest of her life. And about six months later, I decided, yeah, not so much. And so I, went to, I started looking around, and I had been approached a lot by public relations firms who at the time were looking for subject matter experts on things like, I, I was kind of an expert on energy pricing and pharmaceuticals and agriculture. And um, I didn't know anything about public relations, so I went to night school to see what public relations was all about. And before you were allowed to take a public relations class, you had to take a reporting class. And that was kind of the end of that. <laughs> we, we kind of went from there, and so then I started applying to grad schools, and I was lucky enough to get into Maryland, where I just had a great experience. The, um, so that transition from you know, government, uh, government economist to the newsroom, it looks like the experience in trying to find out if people were lying probably uh, Worked probably out pretty well, yeah. yeah Except for the pay cut. Everything was good. <laughs> well, that's, that's the downside. <laughs> it was the downside. But no, it, it was very much my first jobs really right out of school were, were very close to what a reporting job is. Okay. Your, your particular specialty, our particular specialty, I've known Sarah for years, and we uh, overlap a lot in terms of the things we do and our interests and so on. Uh, explain to students who may not know a lot about what we mean when we're talking about data journalism. What, what is it? Well, is it the final? One of the things I talk about with data journalism, how many people here have heard of data journalism? It's about half of you have heard of one. I bet every single person who raised their hand thinks that it means something completely different than what the other one does. So it's come to mean a lot of things. For, for what I do and much of what Steve has done in his career, it's a reporting job, it's not a presentation or a distribution job, and that's changed a lot in the last few years. What I like to think of as what my job is, is to document the way that a system works compared to the way a system is supposed to work. So all the stories that Steve talked about, the challenge was to figure out what's supposed to happen. How is a government supposed to keep children from being killed? How is a farm subsidy system supposed to help keep family farms in business? And how are landlords supposed to act when they, uh, when they want to turn their buildings into condos? And so then my job is entirely to figure out how do you measure whether or not they're doing that or not. And most of that is public records work. Um, a lot of people like to think that we now have unlimited amount of data available to us, unfortunately, and Ron Downey here at, at ASU has written quite a nice paper on this, uh, unfortunately most of what the open government movement gives us is government propaganda. So uh, it's still a lot of public, public records work where we have to go out and figure out what documents and data exist, and how might I be able to tell whether they're doing what they are, what they claim they're doing, and what they're supposed to do. And it's, it sounds simple, but figuring out what's supposed to happen often isn't easy, and measuring what really does happen can be even harder. So a lot of my work takes a long time, and I mean, pretend it doesn't. Does being a data journalist mean you spend your whole career in front of a computer, or do you get to do the kind of reporting that uh, that our students are being trained to do and that, that you first got a chance to do in your papers? Not only get to, have to. Um, there is no way, what I look at it as, I spend part of my time in the lab and then I go out to the field and check what I've learned in the lab and then bring what I found in the field back to the lab. 
Um, I'm looking for different things than some of the other reporters on my team are looking for. Um, we often have a little bit of a clash because my I usually work on teams. There's usually three of us, and, and the best teams I think are made up of uh, reporting teams are made up of usually three people. One is an incredible street reporter, somebody who knows everybody and can go anywhere. And I was lucky enough, for example, to work at the Washington Post with Sarah Burroughs, who may be the best street reporter I've ever met. Um, but incredible street reporters. Then there are great writers, the people who every time they go out and they report, they are thinking about how that's going to be written. And then there are people who are great documents reporters. And that's what I think of as data journalism, is a very, very sophisticated form of documents reporting. And the reason we get into somewhat of a clash sometimes is that these great writers and street reporters, what they want is the great character. What they're looking for is the character and the anecdote that is going to grasp everybody's interest and will drive a, a story forward. Um, I'm looking to go beyond that. So we're going to be asking different questions. I'm going to be asking that character to show me every piece of paper that ever filled out. So we're going to be sitting down and we'll say, when you had to apply for this form of subsidy, what were the forms you had to fill out? What did you have to prove? Where did you have to go? What hoops did you have to jump through? How often did they come visit you? What did you have to fill out? So I'm looking for every paper trail that's ever existed. And my partners are like, come on, you've got a great story. Why do you have to get in the way of this fantastic story? And the reason is, both at the Washington Post and the New York Times, we don't do stories about one anecdote. If we do, it's a feature story. Or it could be a really innovative feature story, um, like Snowfall, which may be the most innovative feature story ever. But it's not an investigation. That an investigation has to show you how a system works. And we might have great examples of how that system fell apart, but unless we can describe in what ways it's not meeting its, its needs, and it's not meeting the law, it's not meeting what it claims it does, then all we really have is an anecdote. And so um, you have to be out on the street seeing that. The other side of it is when I find things in data, I have to go out on the street and see whether or not a three-dimensional world looks the same way that a two-dimensional world looks. And it's amazing how you can see things in documents. How many of you have ever gone out and read a court document in a courthouse? A half? You read a court document. I mean, how much fun is reading court documents, right? It's like, it's awesome. But uh, you go out and you read a court document, and you don't even know what happened until you go talk to the people. And all of a sudden, it's a little more nuanced. It's not quite what it looked like in black and white on the page. So uh, any data journalist who isn't out on the street is really only doing maybe a third of their job. The, um, the District's Lost Children series is a good example of you know, heartbreaking anecdotes, uh, but data journalism is part of it. Now. Explain the data journalism part of that uh, horrifying series. Yeah, well the story, for any of y'all who aren't uh, familiar with it, was about, um, it started with a, a young girl named Brianna who was killed by her caretaker. And Sari, uh, who was her mentioned earlier, and Scott Lyon, both incredible reporters, and spent some time looking at how every system there was to, to prevent her death had fallen apart. And I wasn't involved in any at any point in this, until one day somebody turned to Sari and said something pretty harrowing. And that question was, I don't know why you're paying all this attention to Brianna, what about all the others? What do you mean, all the others? What do you mean all the others? So it became quite clear. I mean, actually it was the simplest conceptual story I've ever worked on. Conceptually, it was simple. What happened to all the others? And the first thing was, how many others were there? How do we find the others? Every record about this was secret. And so we started trying to piece it together, little by little by little by little. And in the end, what we ended up with, in, in some ways, was a classic social science study, even though it didn't look like it in the paper, was we did a content analysis of an agency's own records. 
And those records showed that the children were dying for the same predictable reasons year after year after year, even after they had been warned that uh, these problems existed. So what, I mean, my husband used to joke, I mean, he used to laugh at me because I go home, and he said, are you doing your boxes this weekend? And what he meant was I had boxes and boxes of redacted documents and I'm trying to piece together what did the government know and when did it know it. So that part of it was really building some kind of methodology to hold the government accountable. And one thing about the heroin stories that I really appreciated working at the Post on that story on was that at every point, everybody on the team, from my fellow reporters, the immediate editors, uh, the managing editor, and the executive editor, Glenn Downey, all agreed that this was not about children and the families. I'm, you know, it sounds funny, but this was not about the children and their families. This was about the government. And we had to keep that focus away from heartbreaking stories of dysfunctional families, which these were, and on the responsibilities that the government said that it had taken on and had not taken on. That's, data journalism usually means numbers are involved. Numbers terrify journalists. How do you, how do you find uh, ways to tell what what many journalists would think is a very dry subject uh, to tell the story in a way that would grab readers and uh, and also the the, you know, the the pleasure of the journalist who's actually working with it. Yeah, and one of the things that I appreciate so much, I mean, I feel like you're just so much my hero on this, is that I think both of us work the same way in a lot of ways. We work from what I call the bottom up, not the top down, and that is, I don't want the government to give me statistics or numbers. What I want is a record of every incident, and then I'll generate my own numbers. And what that does is it lets you frame the question the way you want to frame it, but even better, you know, I, I mentioned this in a, a class today, one of my favorite quotes about numbers comes from Paul Bordeaux, who used to work for the New Yorker and uh, was an environmental writer there. And his quote is that, um, I don't remember those statistics or numbers, but statistics are people with the tears washed away. And it's really, when you think of these numbers as some kind of summary of a human situation, and when you get to look at every document that went in underneath it, all of a sudden they're not numbers. This is, this is, this is just counting up things, and we have an example under each and every one of these things. And that's why I really get frustrated if I have to start with data and then move down and try to find examples. Um, and that's why I spend so much time on public records flights because I want to see every single case. And I want to decide how to count them up. And I don't want some PR person to tell me the way it should be counted up. And so I joke that I don't really do statistics. I do really good counting and summing. And that's about it most of the time. But um, what I do do is I do it with a method, and we do it with, with original documents. And it's almost closer to being uh, a sociologist, or an historian, or an anthropologist, than it is to being a data scientist or a, or a computer scientist. A lot of people who hear about data journalism think it's a matter of sitting in front of a computer and hitting a few buttons and Patterns and We'd stories. Like to that. that would be really cool. Right. Yeah. Uh, some of our editors think that on occasion. <laughs> what kind of work actually goes into data journalism before you get to the point where you can hit those few buttons and, and the story starts magically appearing? The same drudgery that goes into all kinds of reporting. Um, you know, when you read a story, especially a long project, the amount of drudgery, just in terms of reading, and documenting and figuring out what it is you're looking at and going down bad directions and um, any kind of project reporting means wasting a lot of time. And I once had an editor at the Washington Post, Jeff Lee, who was a wonderful editor. And did you work with Jeff? I worked with Jeff with there. Yeah, there. Um, one day I walked into Jeff's office after having spent months on a project just not really getting very far. And then 
were maybe a month out from publishing and, and realized there's a really good way to do this. This is really smart. And I, I was very proud of myself. And I walked in and I was like, you must get really tired of me wasting six months and then coming in and telling you, oh, now I know how to do it. And he was so nice. He said, no, that six months was what you spent figuring out, knowing when you would know that it was the right way. So um, there's just a lot of reading. There's a lot of reporting. There's a lot of trying things. Um, and you'd be amazed at how little of that time is in front of a computer and how much of it is reporting. Um, and, and I think that you probably had the same experience that you know, I'll be calling people up and saying, I mean, it's something as simple as calling an academic expert and saying, I know you didn't get a grant to do everything you wanted to do on this subject. What is it that you've always wanted to do that I'm at the New York Times or the Washington Post and I have six months and I have money, what would you do? And, uh, you know, they have all kinds of ideas. So, so much of this work is the same reporting you're doing day in and day out that you're learning to do. What kind of skills do young journalists need to learn to be able to do data journalism? Depends what kind of data journalism you want to do, right? Um, uh, when I think about data journalism, I kind of think about it in four piles, um, if you want to think of them. And my pile is just one of four, and it's the one I love, but it's not the only legitimate one. Um, if you think about data journalism, there might be the great visualizations that the New York Times is incredibly well known for. Um, if you want to be on the New York Times, you know, graphics desk, it helps if you know something about journalism, but you're gonna go to a design school or a computer science school that they're, that what they're focused on is visualizing information in a way that's engaging and imaginative and and useful, but it doesn't necessarily require journalism experience. They, of course, are incredibly skilled journalists, but maybe not always by training. So that's one element, the visualization element. We do visualization on our team only as an exploratory activity. So some of the ones that, if I were to show you some of the things I made, it's like laughable, but it got me where I needed to go. Um, Another form of data journalism is what some people call interactive news or news applications. ProPublica is probably best known for theirs. Um, and that is really a pretty significant computer science background. Um, you have to worry about things like, um, can you handle a million and a half hits in 10 minutes? Can you, how do you scale? How do you produce for mobile as well as uh, as well as desktop. Um, I'm not allowed anywhere near either of those departments at the New York Times. They would be horrified if I did anything for publication like that. And then another newer form of data journalism is what a lot of people think of as Nate Silver 538 and what we have at the, at the New York Times as the upshot, um, which is almost more about writing about data than it is what I call doing data journalism. You're often writing about other people's data in a way that's incredibly engaging and incredibly explanatory, but it may be more akin to science writing than it is to investigative or in-depth reporting. Um, so all of those are different forms of data journalism, and what I do is much more investigative enterprise reporting. Um, so having said that, what do you need to do what I do? Um, I think you know, it's incredible that still 25 years on, um, it is amazing how few people have enough facility with a spreadsheet to be able to actually do anything with it that can produce a story and that you still maybe get 30 or 40% of your stories might be nothing more than good spreadsheet skills. Um, another thing I was talking with another group today about is at this point, with the bad public records that we have now, the inability to get governments to faith, what I would say, to follow the basic public records laws, um, you are now forced as a reporter to be really good at web scraping. 
And what that means is when the government wants you to look up your own doctor on a doctor disciplinary site, but you want the record of every doctor so that you can evaluate which ones actually had specific problems, you have to scrape that site and you have to find a way to get behind the computer programming. And pretty much you have to be able to do some programming to do that. The tools that are available are really bad. They don't work. Every site is different. You might as well just learn to do some programming. That's a good point. Um, when you went to college to learn to be a journalist, how many of the tools you use now did you learn in college? Zero. Okay. <laughs> how, so how did you how did you uh, how did you learn to be who you are now? I mean, I was lucky enough to work in Florida, where public rec first of all in grad school, I was incredibly encouraged to develop those tools and just those skills. It's just that they weren't taught and. So that's the first thing is kind of that idea that yes, do this, do this. You know, it's like it's not like this is not a waste of your time. Um, but I was lucky enough to be a reporter in Florida where they had really good public records laws, and I was covering, say, healthcare, and I call the agency and ask. I don't know. A doctor. I was just telling the story earlier. The, the doctor cut off the wrong leg of the diabetic patient, and and everybody was blaming it on big hospitals laying off nurses to make more money. And we had all these quotes in the paper about how yes, it's a it's a travesty. How many nurses have been fired? And I had this horrible problem because every union and everybody I met could never send me to one person who had ever been laid off. And if you've ever done any of this reporting, like they are happy to trot out 30 people. You know, there's a problem if you can't find anybody. And um, so I happened to know that they had this form that every hospital had to fill out about how many hours every nurse had in every, every, um, every floor. And when we got the data and analyzed it, we discovered that there hadn't been any nurses laid off. And, and in fact, there was a higher nurse ratio then than there had been for 20 years. There were other reasons there were problems in hospitals. I wouldn't want to pretend that there weren't. But kind of what happened 10 years later had not happened yet. And the big lesson I got from that was we went back and called the person we quoted the first night in the paper who told us it was a statewide expert on hospital economics and all this. And he had told us all about how there was this crisis of nurses being laid off. And I asked him, I forget his name. And he goes, huh, I don't know where I got this. I guess he was wrong. <laughs> because I was like, I must be wrong, right? I, I mean, I'm not seeing what you told me. He's like, nah, I, I can't really tell you where I saw that. I, I guess I just thought I'd seen it. And that was when I kind of decided, I don't want somebody telling me facts. That if I'm going to deal with facts, I'm going to figure out the facts myself and let people interpret them, let people lead me to them, let people show me how to get them. But getting facts as a quote just aren't facts. And so that was kind of, I was almost, I was forced to. I also got lucky. I was covering economics and workplace issues for the Tampa Tribune. And one of my sources was the head of uh, a local university think tank. And frankly, it was terrible at what they did. They were kind of bought and sold by the Chamber of Commerce. But the good part was that he played golf every Thursday afternoon with all the Chamber of Commerce people. And he let me go over and use his computer with all the great software while he was going on on Thursdays. So I had access to something where I could actually do the work. Started learning to teach yourself to do things like web scraping. Uh, so yeah, that, that really was my experience too. Same thing. I, uh, none of the tools that I wound up using in my career are things I learned in, uh, in college. What I did learn was how to learn new things. Yeah, and I think that's the big thing is that, you know, that confidence to say that there is something out there that will answer this question and I can figure it out if I need to. It was the thing that you get in school. You, you know, if there was a time when a lot of J schools spent, I don't know how many of you all remember even, but Flash, everybody had to learn Flash, right? Well, that lasted three years. 
And so now, I mean, the idea of using Flash in the newsroom is kind of crazy. And so, uh, but all those people who spent all those years learning ActionScript, which is the programming language behind Flash, now know how to use JavaScript, and now know how to use all the other languages that are very similar. And I've never learned a foreign language. I have no facility for it at all. But I'm told that once you learn one or two, the third one's even easier, and the fourth one's easier than that. Um, the big thing that I think we recognize in school and recognize through great editors who you get to work with is that there's potential. There is a way to get to what you want to get to, and you'll figure it out. Me, uh, you and I have both done, you know, sort of heavy lifting, serious, thumb-sucking, uh, you know, projects that... Uh, Some more interesting yeah, than others. Well, but that are at the heart <laughs> of, uh, you know, major social problems and things like that. I have to say that probably the best read project I ever did involved taking the dog license database for uh, the city of Miami and producing counts of what are the most popular breeds of dogs and things like that. Do you ever get to do sort of non-serious kinds of things with your uh, I, I do, actually. There's one I was working on the other day, and I'm really upset we didn't get to publish it, actually. It was one is I'm trying to learn something called natural language processing, which is linguistics approaches to working with documents to try to tease out uh, patterns in language. And so one of our reporters wanted to do something about the presidential campaigns and kind of this idea that we have two presidential candidates, Donald Trump and, and, and Cruz, who seem to think the world is ending and are in this constant state of like, oh my God, everything's awful. And we have a couple of presidential candidates in the Republican side who are looking ahead and being really optimistic. Our best days are ahead of us. Here's what we want to do. That would be Bush and Rubio. And he had a couple of examples, and he ended up actually writing the story with those couple of examples, because that was too slow. But it was a really fun, it was like one of those things, like I wish we could do it, and I think we will, um, where I learned how to, uh, some, we're really lucky, we have this whole machine learning group at the New York Times that's entirely based on reader, uh, it's based on predicting who's going to be a subscriber, and uh, analytics on the website, but the great thing is you don't get great computer scientists and machine learning people working for the New York Times unless they want to have something to do with news because they can earn probably three times as much as Google. So we have all these incredibly smart people in our room who love talking about what's going on in news and helping us figure out how to do news. So one of them showed me how to isolate noun phrases and all the transcripts and then do an analysis on what kind of phrases all of these, these people were doing. And again, it wasn't published, but it's just a recent example of one that was really fun. So I did it, and I figured out how to do it. And it was one of, uh, I think, Trump, what you came out with was that he just says nothing. There was absolutely no substance in anything of his, his, his analysis. It was tremendously great, me, and you know, like all kinds of stuff, like I'll be the best, all this stuff. And then there was uh, Senator Cruz, who was, there's a war on religion and all this stuff. And then there was Rubio, who was talking about foreign policy. And there was Jeb Bush, who was talking about domestic policy. And it really was interesting how kind of pulling apart the linguistics of what they're doing really told you a little bit about how they're running their campaigns. And I think. If I had been able to get that at the right timing to do that story, I was about two days late. And um, the great lesson of journalism is two days late, you might as well have not done that, right? So, but I don't feel like you might as well have done it. Like, that would have been a great that would have been a, That would have been a fun one to do. Uh, you're president of IRE. You've been a longtime member and trainer and so on in IRE. Um, Many students I know think of, if they've heard of investigative reporters and editors, they think it's a place for only the trench coat wearing uh, reporters who show up in parking garages at midnight to talk to sources go. Why should, uh, why should students be considering joining something? Well, the like first that? reason is if you're a student and you join now, it's $25 until for like three years after you graduate instead of $70. So that's the first reason. Right. But the second reason is, you know, when I was just starting out as a beat reporter, and uh, 
when I was starting out, I went to an IRA conference, and there was a speaker there who had just done a whole series, and why am I blanking on his name? I can't picture him. Rosalie Cunningham. Uh, you know, yeah, he had just won a Pulitzer for a, a year or two long story about kind of a woman who lived in D.C. and was uh, had just a lot of troubles. It was kind of a, a, a sociological study as much as anything else. And it was this incredibly powerful story about this woman named Rosalie coming out. And um, Walter Dash, is that his name? Right. And so I went to a uh, Leon, 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 Leon Dash. Leon Dash, right. Leon Dash. It's an amazing story. You guys should read it if you can ever get your hands on it. And I, I went to this panel at IRE, and I was thinking exactly what you think. Okay, this is for the people who get to spend a year and a half on the story. And they have some kind of magic, right? All of a sudden, like a, a, somebody walks up to you and gives you a bunch of stuff, or they have sources, and they're going to they're gonna tell you things. And, and I, I didn't, it was all a mystery. I didn't understand how this worked. And, and he explained how he started out on this story, and his editor had assigned a story about the underclass. OK, now what is more boring? and the underclass, right? And so he started thinking, how do I find out about the underclass? So what he did, and what he did was he laid out a methodology about how to get to a great story. And that methodology in his case was, um, okay, I'm gonna read all of the academic literature about what was then called the underclass. I don't think we call them that anymore. But uh, about people who are permanently impoverished and permanently underprivileged, and all of the associated drug and, and housing and all the associated issues that go along with that. And um, after he had read all of the academic papers, he said he sat down and he spent all this time like looking at these pieces of paper and realized there is one place that all of this comes together, and that's jail. And so he spent a year hanging out at the jail. Now, he was very bitter. Because what happened was, while he was trying to find his perfect characters for the story, he happened to uncover a major drug smuggling ring that was going in and out of jail. And his editors made him write it, and she was really pissed off. <laughs> but, but the idea was that I already, what you learn is how you go about finding these stories. What sounds like magic isn't magic. It's drudgery, it's imagination, but it isn't that people go hang out in these, um, in these parking lots, and you don't have to spend a year. The other thing I learned at IRE early on was that, you know, in beat reporting, the process of beat reporting is asking the same questions that you ask in a major investigation. And there are a lot of people who never want to spend a year on a story, and I may actually be one of them. Um, the people I work with now at the Times, They'll spend a year on a story and act every day as if there is no tomorrow. I mean, these are people who know they're not going to publish for a year, and if they haven't gotten something in 24 hours, they're having a conniption, right? And so uh, it's a very specific personality that can handle that kind of pressure over a year. And I've worked with reporters on long-term stories where they would be reporters and they're like, I have never been able to get as long as I think. This is awful. So, but all of those same skills come into play with beat reporting, come into, even with, with feature reporting. How do you find a public record? What does a public record look like? Um, how do you distinguish a story from a study? How do you ask questions? What's the best way to interview people? Those is what, that's what you learn at IRE. You don't learn how to go meet people in I would say all the best uh, investigative stories I, uh, that I was ever part of and the ones that I know about all came out of good beat reporting. Some beat reporter heard, heard something that, uh, that wound up turning into you know, wonderful investigation, just like Leon had, uh, had done. Uh, I know some of you guys will have some questions. Uh, maybe it's time to bring the, uh, bring the microphone out and, and sort of uh, those of you who have a question, you can. I'm standing in the middle of that, or I don't know if that's back there. Here we go. Here comes a. Uh, here comes a. Uh, 
things that might. If anybody has a question, go to uh, go to that. Um, while we're uh, we'll waiting for a couple of people to line up, uh, talk a little bit about the work you did at Duke when you were uh, the chair of computational journalism. Well, that? the whole idea when I went to Duke, I had this incredibly naive idea, and that is that since Steve and I have been doing this kind of work, Steve a little bit longer than me. But I would argue that we are doing our work the same way today that we did 20 years ago. That once the advent of the public internet came in the mid-90s, the methods we're using are effectively the same as they have been. Basic social science methodology, counting, databases, spreadsheets, some mapping, a little bit of network analysis. The rest of the world has moved on and is doing incredible work with big data, uh, things like voice recognition, things like uh, you know, responsive websites where you can see exactly what it is. And my dream was we would create tools that would make it easy for journalists and reporters to do investigative reporting in a more modern way. It was a, a complete failure. So what we learned was that there is no market for tools for reporters. Um, there is no incentive system that would, every time you get a great tool for a reporter, it has to move to a bigger market because reporters have no money, and then it becomes useless for reporting. So now my obsession is kind of moving backwards is saying, okay, how do we learn to adapt new methods to, uh, to reporting, even if there aren't easy tools? And just one example of that is we were doing a story about a year and a half ago, two years ago, on uh, Chinese art forgeries. And it's the first time I know of where we used algorithms to uh, match images to see that something like 1,500 copies of what appeared to be the same painting had been sold at auction over a year. And um, so we were able to show that this probably was a forgery going over time because it, it was a very prolific artist and he did a lot of paintings, but how many could be called shrimp on branch or something like that. And um, so, but using image matching, the same image matching that you can use in Google when you go do an image matching, there's no reason we can't do that in reporting. So what I'm looking for is to say, how do we use those machine learning, natural language processing, really advanced what they call statistical learning techniques to have more fun as reporters. And my dream, of course, is you get the document dump of Hillary Clinton's emails, and you take 200 pages, and you say, interesting, not interesting. Now, can I tell how the computer tell me what pages I'm likely to find interesting or not out of the other 10,000 pages? That would be awesome. And that's what machine learning is all about. So it's about predicting what we're going to be able to do next. So now my goal is to try to really bring this into something where we can say what are the, uh, what are the real opportunities and what are the pipe dream opportunities of new statistical and I hope you make it work. Hi. Uh, women can't be in computer science. Women can't do math. Uh, you know, women can't even be in the newsroom. Have you seen those stereotypes in your career, and how, how do you address them? Let me put it this way: In 2001, I think it was, there was a Women of Car, Women of Computer Sister Reporting, at the at the annual. National Association of Computer Sister Reporting Conference, which is every spring and every about every spring and brings together basically newsrooms. And there were six of us. And now those six, I run computer sister reporting at the New York Times. One runs digital and, and data reporting at the Center for Investigative Reporting. Another runs data journalism at Reuters. Another runs uh, data journalism at The Guardian. I think we're okay. I really do. The latest Women in Car had uh, last year's conference, um, I believe, had 400 people at it. So we're doing okay. We got the skills, it doesn't matter how you It ask. really doesn't matter. Hello, I'm uh, Corey Hawk. Not that that's important. When it, it's always important. <laughs> um, you talk a lot about sifting through documents, but 
would it ever be feasible in the future for journalists to do large-scale research themselves? Because, like, you say that in the government, uh, a lot of it's propaganda. To remove that sort of bias, would it be possible for journalists in the future to do that research, uh, you know, in, um, in an optimized way? Well, I think we already are in a lot of ways. I mean, a lot of the records we're working with are administrative records as opposed to records that we've gone out and collected ourselves. But one of the changes, and actually probably the only real change from when Steve and I started doing this, is censored journalism, um, perhaps drone journalism, perhaps robots. Um, that there are now methods of us collecting real-time data without problems of legalities. Even with drones, there are some areas where we can do it ourselves. But I would argue that we have been doing original research for quite a while. The difference being, I, I don't want to get too in the weeds on this, but when we think about statistics, there are kind of two branches of statistics, descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Um, we're probably not going to be doing a lot of inferential statistics. That's really when you, before you all learn off that familiar with it, it's when you determine cause and effect. Um, does smoking cause cancer? We are in a much better position to say that smoking goes along with cancer and we can't say it causes it. And as we stick to descriptive work, we're already doing original research. And in fact, in my newsroom and in every newsroom I've worked at, if somebody else has already done the work, I'm not going to do it. What's the point? Uh, so I'm only going to do things that nobody else has ever tried. And so I think we're already doing this one. One of the real nice things about government data is it very often has not been looked at by the government. They gather it, but they don't know what's in it. And uh, for us, it's the thrill of discovery. Well, one of the things I would say is like sometimes you get these government data sets, and they're such a mess that you realize it's like it's jumping up and down like nobody could possibly have ever looked at this. Because there's no way this data could exist in this form if anybody cared about it. Yeah. So you, you mentioned web scraping. You, you did this in another class. And I wanted to ask you this question then because I was looking it up and there's so many types of web scraping and methods. So how, how do you really uh, get started learning about web scraping and which method do you personally find most useful? Um, the method is totally irrelevant. I mean, it's I happen to use Python, but there's no reason. Um, I happen to use Python because I happen to know other people who know how to use Python and they will help me. That's, that's my entire reason for learning any computer language, is that there are other people around who can answer questions. Um, but uh, I think that just like every other part of reporting, not just computer assisted reporting, not just data journalism, but every other part of reporting, is the only way you do it is by having a story that you can't get any other way. And knowing that the opportunity is there, that if I only knew how to do this, I could have this story, you'd be amazed at what you can learn when you've got something you want to get done. Um, and it might mean that you've heard of web scraping, you kind of know what you can do, and you know that if somebody can help you get there, then you would be able to do this story you will get somebody to help you. You will figure it out. You want to do it. But I've never met a reporter who can learn something for the sake of learning it without having a story that they wanted to do. Right, great, thanks. Uh, I'll add uh, yeah, Paul Bradshaw's book on web Oh, that's pretty good, yeah. yeah it's it's, it's a, little a little outdated, but little it's Yeah, it's got exercises in it. It gets you thinking. Yeah, it's a good yeah, book. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't have to do with it. Hello, my name is Louise, and my question is, what is the most outrageous statistic that you've come upon, and how has that statistic been used to either like help or to like better understand Yikes. the problem? Whatever the problem is. You got me stumped on this one. I mean, I would I would say what thirty six dead kids. That's a outrageous statistic. That, but that, that didn't exist. Have, that's the well, thing. Is well, that like? I'm trying to think of one that existed that then, you know, we went after. And um, it's almost all the work I've done, we created the only statistic we get. But I'll mention one, and it turned out not to be true, but it was something that uh, I spent about six months working on when I first got to the Times. 
We've been working on a story on uh, police uh, involved in domestic violence. And uh, the statistic that, that got thrown around a lot was that police officers are something like three or four times more likely to be involved in police, um, what they call police instigated domestic violence uh, than other people. It turned out to be completely untrue, but it was certainly something that gets your attention. I guess my questions to people are less tell me what's happening after after it's tell me what's happening is more how do you know? And when you ask that question, how do you know that that's true, that will help you get to my, but I totally depend on sources to lead me through the thicket of data, documents, you know, wrong avenues, misunderstanding of what something means. I mean, developing sources in this line of reporting is just as important as in everywhere else. And in the end, if you have worked with sources long enough, they actually know enough about what you're doing is to give you quotes that actually mean something. Because they're familiar enough with what you've done to know what the, what the uh, strengths and weaknesses of your methods are. You're never going to get anything perfectly. And so and we have to be willing to run a story even if we can't get to the bottom of everything. If we were, we'd just be totally paralyzed. So we totally depend on sources to help us put into context what we can and can't do. Well, one of the things I learned about data journalism is it will answer who, what, where, uh, when, all those great five W's and H except for why. It doesn't tell you why. Sometimes the not how. <laughs> Some, right, you sometimes have to dig that out. But uh, why is never answered by the data. And to, to get that answer of why, you have to do what Sarah was talking about find people to explain why that, that pattern emerged from the day. And that's why it's so important to go back out into the street reporting, too, is that it just doesn't look the same on paper as it looks in real life. I mean, it's one thing for me to say, OK, these, these landlords are not, are not uh, keeping up their buildings and in order to, to drive out tenants um, to turn their buildings into condos, it's another thing to go to that building and see the kind of squalor that people are living in now. I mean, we always have to remember on this is that nobody starts out wanting to live in a building with mold and no running water. And, you know, things happen slowly and over time. And it's never as obvious as it looks like. And no landlord really wants to own a building where there's mold flowing down the walls and, you know, but they don't have any money and they know, you know it, it, everything is more nuanced than it looks like. And so it's so important to get out there and talk to people and see it because it's, it's really easy to think that you know what's going on when you don't. That's it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is Chair. Uh, my name is Yvette, and uh, the team members that you've worked with at the Post and the Times, uh, how diverse were their specialty backgrounds that they weren't in journalism? If you weren't in journalism, you were more into the economy than to journalism. I imagine some other team members were also in different specialties before you know, getting into Most it. of them have been reporters their whole careers. Uh, one story I worked with, there's uh, a reporter who's now at Reuters who had been a lawyer and covered the Supreme Court for many years. Um, there's a reporter I've worked with a little bit at the Times, not much, he's a doctor. Um, but uh, mostly, most of the reporters I've worked with have been reporting at all first. But the specialties are still used, and if they have known other things in their own special way. Yeah, and you know, different, different news organizations have different feelings on this. I mean, I think even the Times is a little bit, uh, uh, schizophrenic about it. Um, in some ways, they love people to have a total expertise and a total ability to be authoritative on a beat on the on Federal Reserve or on medicine or on something else. And on another hand, they want everybody to be able to jump into any job at any time. So, uh, so it's a big mix. On that. So, and I mean, 
I think you can make a good career, but it's a question of career. You can make a great career either way, by being a great generalist or by being, you know, a specialist. Um, I think when I was in grad school, um, Carl Sessions stuff, who's still in Maryland, had this incredibly prescient piece, and I asked him about it recently because I wasn't able to find it, and he doesn't even remember writing it, but I know I read it. And it was, um, he's back in like 1991, 92, he wrote that in the future there would be these different kinds of journalists. And one would be a great observer, somebody who is your eyes and ears and can see things that nobody else can see. And that's what a great foreign correspondent is, right? They have the context around them where I could go see the same thing and not see what they saw. Um, and then there's the great explainer, somebody who knows this topic really well and can make it simple and make it easy. And then there are the investigators who are going to hold people accountable. And there's the great writers who are going to entertain you. And, and the one thing that he said there wouldn't be any more of in the future were the shovelers, who are just going to take things that other people tell you and shovel them in. And it's amazing how 25 years later that's really what's happened, right? The shovelers, we don't have a lot of value for anymore. But those other specialties are just as valued now as they were a long time. Thank you. We've got time for, luckily, a couple more questions. And more people. All right. Um, so what, would, what advice or what skills would you recommend for a young journalist going into, who wants to go into the state of journalism? Like, what do you know now that you would, that you wish, like, if you wanted to go into the same career, you would be able, like, you would recommend doing to get there? That makes sense. The more I could learn about public records and documents, the, the better. And more, I wish I were more fluent in that. Okay. Um, that I, you know, I've done some matrix algebra and calculus, but it's been a long time. And my point is, I can't read, I'm not fluent enough at reading math to be able to understand what's happening without a lot of work. And now that's saying a lot, because getting to that point of fluency with math is difficult. Um, but it's almost like the math is more important than the programming. Programming isn't that hard. Programming is just like time, right? It's like, I'm going to spend all night and I'm going to get there. It's really not that hard. Writing a recipe. It, it, it's, a, it's a recipe, and, and I've now screwed up that recipe and made some really bad cookies that go over and over again, but it's really not that hard now, I know, to adjust. Um, but especially when you're not trying to program for other people to use, if you're just trying to program to answer a question, right? Um, but the math is really tough. Is and it more statistics math or more model kind of calculus driven? I'd say the pure math, the calculus and matrix algebra. And only because you can learn any statistics and most any of the more modern techniques um, with the pure math. Now maybe that's just because that's what I don't know. And everybody values what they don't know more than what they do. So maybe I'm just projecting. But to me, that's my biggest weakness is I cannot open, I can't open a lot of things that look really promising and get through them because I can't read the formulas. So. I'll, I'll give you a, uh, I'll throw out a commercial for myself. Uh, take uh, JMC 465 um, or MCO 510 if you're, in, uh, if you're in graduate school. I teach that. I had at least an introduction to the statistics and to the data journalism and all that in there. Uh, and then go on from there to, to become a Sarah. <laughs> but I would say, like, uh, the, the, sci the, the basic scientific methods, I mean, they've changed a lot. I, I, I was talking to, um, there's a guy who's a, like a rock star at Harvard. His name's Gary King, and he's a university professor at Harvard. And uh, so there's 10 of them, I think. And they're allowed, this is like somebody who's allowed to teach in any department at Harvard because he's so brilliant. And he runs something called the Institute for Qual Quantitative Social Studies. And, um, he can make anything simple, but oh, but he's written a lot about how scientific method is changing. That it used to be that we felt that uh, deductive reasoning was the gold standard, 
And now inductive reasoning is becoming much more important because now that we can measure everything, we don't have to have so many theoretical mm -hmm. constructs around it. And so once you can look at every example of something, you don't have to be so theoretical about what a sample might say. You don't have to work as much in sampling. So scientific and statistics are changing really fast. And learning a little bit more about that would be really useful. Yeah, a lot of statistics dealt with dealing with margins of error in samples, but most of our data journalism is we get it all. We get all the records, and uh, so there's no margin of error, I guess, what it is. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Oh, you're, okay. So, we're done? I think we're done. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. And, thank you guys uh, for coming. Okay. Appreciate it.